December 1st, the Supreme Court heard its second major abortion rights case this session. In Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, the court could narrow or even overturn the right to abortion in the U.S. established nearly 50 years ago. President Joe Biden is following the legal fight closely. As a candidate, he campaigned on expanding reproductive rights. I would codify Roe v. Wade as, as defined by Casey. It should be the law. But as a devout Catholic, Biden's history with this issue is complex. Today, we present a special episode on Biden and abortion from Politico's Playbook Deep Dive podcast, featuring reporters Ruby Kramer and Ryan Lizza. From his studio at the Leonard Davis Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, I'm Dan Gorenstein, and this is Tradeoffs. With Biden, there's always been a presumption, this almost unspoken rule that for him, mass is so sacred and his church is so sacred that it is an incredibly private space. I'm Ryan Lizza. This is Playbook Deep Dive. It just feels like a weirdly personal moment that like you're kind of like observing through a literal fence. Like it has a fishbowl element that's like plays out so literally as to almost be ridiculous. As a rule dating back to the election, the reporters who follow the president go pretty much everywhere with him, except two places, inside his home and inside his church. Communion is this, for Catholics, a, a literal moment before God, and that's as personal as you can get. But it's also the president of the United States occupying this like incredibly public role of being the nation's second Catholic president. Joe Biden's trips to St. Joseph on the Brandywine, the pale yellow church in Delaware, where he's worshipped for decades. is like a really sweet looking building and just kind of like it's surrounded by 19th century tombstones. It has a very sort of like Irish Gothic feel. Have long been a source of fascination for Ruby Kramer. Hi, I'm Ruby Kramer. I am a senior staff writer at Politico and Politico magazine. Biden, the country's second Catholic president after John F. Kennedy, has been attending this church since the 1970s. And it is the one space that he sort of like has maintained through all of the different phases of his public life, including through being in the White House. His visits are recorded in pool reports from the press, like this one, which read, POTUS left residence at 4.09 p.m. Motorcade is rolling. Ruby and I know these pool reports well. What you actually do is sit on a bus on a road near the president's home, wait for the president to leave his home, as you're sort of getting, you know, security sweeps and all that stuff checked by the Secret Service, and you sit there and you wait. And when he leaves to go to church, the bus, the press bus joins up with the motorcade, drives to the church with him, pulls up to a certain spot, a designated area now, by now, like the routine is down. POTUS arrived at St. Joseph on the Brandywine at 4.12 p.m. And then you sit there, you get out of the bus, you unload, you go up to this area by the fence of the church where you can sort of like look through the bars of the fence and watch you just essentially you watch him walk from the motorcade to the front doors of the church you watch him go inside then that's over <laughs> there's nothing else to see because you're not going in with him POTUS walked out of church at 4:47 p.m. these pool reports ruby writes they leave out the anodyne details of the motorcade's arrival, how the car doors open and the Secret Service agents spill out, fanning across the lawn, how Biden emerges from a darkened back seat, always a few minutes after service begins, how he ducks inside, slipping out of view into a pew near the back without disturbing the congregation. The whole thing happens in a flash. It's a strange feature of this particular president that always sort of stuck in my mind and I kind of wanted to try to explore that further, that sort of public-private element of that moment. Emphasis on the public. Because as personal as his faith may be, 
Biden is in the middle of a very public clash with his own church, a clash over abortion. Yeah, it's a painful one, I think, for him, truly. I do not think that he has ever not dreaded a vote on abortion. So today, abortion, politics, and religion. You know, light stuff. Perfect way to make new friends in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, ever talked about abortion and, and religion? <laughs> <laughs> How about Catholics? What do you think of the Hyde Amendment? Yeah, what do you think of Hyde? So, Ruby... How did the idea for this piece come about? This was a bit of a mutation idea to start. There were two things going on. One was I was always really fascinated by the actual space of Joe Biden's church in Wilmington, which is a very small and old parish called St. Joseph on the Brandywine that was founded in 1841. And it's like where he still kind of has the most unadorned contact with the public outside of the White House bubble. I was like, what is that space? Like, that's an important space. He's there every week. So I was really interested in knowing more about the church. And then at the same time, there is this very fraught debate that was happening inside the actual U.S. hierarchy of the Catholic Church, which is this body, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, USCCB, super amazing acronym, (laughs) where the bishops were wrestling with what it means for Joe Biden to be a Catholic president who is also pro-choice. And they were taking public steps to potentially bar him from communion, which is like basically the whole point of being Catholic. So these two things were going on at once. The Catholic bishops are moving on this resolution that would pre- pre- prevent you and, and others who've um, supported abortion from receiving communion. Are you concerned about the rift in the Catholic Church, and how do you feel personally about that? That's a private matter, and I don't think that's going to happen. I was once a pool reporter at that church. So can you take us through how you started this piece and why. So it is a very weird experience. You know this, Ryan, doing pool duty on days where Joe Biden goes to church. Like, it's just inherently... Tell people what pool duty is. Like, Okay, yeah, let's back up. So certainly when you become president, you have a group of rotating reporters and photographers who follow you around everywhere you go. Obviously, they're not in every single private meeting, but the point is to observe his public movements, to document what he's saying, and to be the eyes and ears of the entire press corps and to circulate sort of reports about what's going on. So throughout the day, we'll get pull report one, pull report two, pull report three about, you know, the president is going into this meeting. He's now leaving the White House to travel to New Jersey to survey storm damage. And and here's, you know, literally what's happening on the ground. So We all sort of cycle through a rotation that's organized by the White House Correspondents Association, blah, 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 blah. On days where the president wants to go to mass, the pool will go with him. But it's a little awkward because when Joe Biden goes to mass, you're not actually going inside the church with him. It just feels like a weirdly personal moment that like you're kind of like observing through a literal fence. Like it has a fishbowl element that's like, plays out so literally as to almost be ridiculous. And it's just, it's a strange feature of this particular president that always sort of stuck in my mind. And I kind of wanted to try to explore that further, that sort of public-private element of that moment. I mean, the only spaces that the pool reporters, you know, that are kind of walled off are like, it's like religion, fundraisers, (laughs) And, you know, their life inside, you know, their home, the the residence. So it's like like, the situation room, right? Like we're talking highly, highly particular spaces. And I actually got an email after my piece came out from the White House reporter for the Associated Press who used to cover George H.W. Bush. And he was saying that the pool for H.W. actually did go inside the church. Hmm. And he was like, I don't know about presidents after. He's like, I can't speak to presidents after 41. But the pool at least went in with H.W. And I think 
with Biden, there's always been a presumption, this almost unspoken rule that for him, mass is so sacred and his church is so sacred that it is an incredibly private space. And I think the interesting tension is that, yes, it's private, and that's always how Biden has treated it. And yes, communion is this sort of, for Catholics, a, a literal moment before God, and that's as personal as you can get. But it's also the president of the United States occupying this like incredibly public role of being the nation's second Catholic president, you know, second to John F. Kennedy. I mean, we've got a history in this country of that being like a very fraught and important and full of meaning sort of role. And what does that mean to people? And, yeah. you know, I mean, that's what's interesting about it, I think. What's so he grew up worshiping John F. Kennedy and knowing quite a bit about the way that Kennedy navigated his own Catholicism. What's changed in America between, I don't mean everything, <laughs> but <laughs> even but, like what, in Catholicism, how, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but how has, you know, running while Catholic changed from Kennedy to Biden? Is it that it went from being something you had to overcome to something that could help you win? What's the main way in which the country voters see Catholicism now in a presidential candidate? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's not exactly done a 180 because it's not as one dimensional as that. It's like three different 180s that overlap in different ways on top of each other. You know, I mean, Kennedy obviously famously flew to Houston to speak to a group of Protestant ministers to basically say... But because I am a Catholic, and no Catholic has ever been elected president, the real issues in this campaign have been obscured, perhaps deliberately, in some quarters less responsible than this. So it is apparently necessary for me to state once again. I will not be a Catholic president. I will be a president who happens to be Catholic. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute. In, in that speech, he sort of defined like a lot of our modern language around the separation of church and state. And that was a really huge moment for him in his campaign and overcoming a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment in the U.S. I believe in an America that is officially neither Catholic, Protestant, nor Jewish, when no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the Pope, the National Council of Churches, or any other ecclesiastical source. I think since then, it no longer matters as much to be like an ethnic Catholic. And I'm not trying to diminish like that identity at all, but I just mean there's not the same prejudice or bias around that as there once was. Yeah. So Joe Biden never had to give that speech, for example. But interestingly, John Kerry kind of did in his own way. But by then, John Kerry, who ran in 2004, like had to navigate the issue. But by then it was already becoming about abortion. And you had some bishops who were threatening to withhold communion from him. I think they called it the wafer wars. Yeah. But, you know, they never went like, act, like John Kerry, to my knowledge, has never been denied communion in the same way that Joe Biden has. A Catholic priest did not give you communion. He said it was because of your position on abortion. Were you offended by that? At least once at a, a Catholic church in South Carolina. Uh, that's a private matter. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but uh, uh, it's the only time it's ever happened. And we didn't talk about it. He went to the press about it. Uh, and it's not a position that I've found anywhere else, including from the Holy Father who gives me communion. He never, John Kerry never had the bishops sort of proposing to write a document targeting him, which is what's happening right now over this issue. So, you know, I, like in a way, everything's changed, but I just think that also we're talking around the demographic shifts in the Catholic Church and, you know, towards the 80s and 90s, seeing huge growth in the number of white Catholics who were basically looking more and more like just conservative voters like in, in America. And so that helped make abortion the preeminent issue in the Catholic church. And 
all of those things contributed to this like very particular environment in which Joe Biden now is at the very center. So it's just different from Kennedy, but it's a continuation yeah. of what started there. But it, it strikes me that what, what, you, what you lay out is the main political problem for Catholic and national politics now is not being Catholic enough, at yeah. least when it comes to some of the uh, things like um, abortion, whereas Kennedy literally had to say he would not follow directions from the Pope because there was so little understanding about Catholicism in America back then that it was taken as an article of faith, uh, no pun intended. <laughs> The, the Pope could tell the president what right. to do, which I think now people would think of that as absurd. Were you raised Catholic? I feel like Lizzie, like yeah. That. Okay, so you know this yeah. I, yeah. Irish Catholic, Irish Italian okay. Catholic. Yeah, yeah. And my grandparents, you know, and my grandparents, like a lot of people of that generation, worship JFK. They, they were the generation that had like a picture of JFK on the wall in their little apartment in New York. And I think Biden had a similar childhood. Yeah. Oh, this is what I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, not to put Biden on the couch too much, but he is a pretty interesting, psychologically, he's, he's yeah, a really interesting figure. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. You excavated this quote that I thought was really good and, and, and worth keeping handy about having a chip on his shoulder. Having a chip on his shoulder is one of, to me, one of the defining characteristics of, of Biden. Oh my God, yes. In all things. Right? And I often think of it Intellectually, he's got a little bit of a chip on his soldier, you know, class wise. Um, it's so much a part of his identity. What's the, the, the chip on his shoulder when it comes to religion and the issues that you were writing about? The, the chip has different dimensions to it, and they are all intertwined with the question of faith because it is a class thing. We basically spent the entire campaign hearing him give a riff about how he would be the only president to not have gone to an Ivy League school since... I think it would be since Reagan, I think, yeah. Thank you. But he's repeated that. I think he actually... It wasn't just a campaign thing. I think he's actually kind of alluded to it in his presidency, too. What's fascinating about his upbringing is that his father was actually a very well-to-do right. businessman for you know, the majority of his early marriage, certainly, and for a time when Joe Biden was very young. And that sort of fell apart. And he had to sort of start over as a used car salesman and the family moved to Delaware. And that was a new start. They moved from Scranton to Delaware. And That's an amazing story. Biden should tell that story on the campaign trail once in a while. <laughs> I think it would be... <laughs> he doesn't tell it quite like that, though, meaning, you know, he doesn't yeah. talk about the... He, yeah. he basically says... I'm from the family of a used car salesman from Scranton, Pennsylvania. And that's true, by the way. Like, it's not like he was raised with a silver spoon in his mouth. But I think the important thing is that he saw that shift happen in his family. Right. The, the kind of fall that his dad had. Exactly. So I think that's part of yeah. where the chip on the shoulder comes from. And it's interesting. And I think it matters that when he the family did move to, to Delaware, he could see from his bedroom in Claymont, the outer buildings of Archmere Academy, which was the nicest, most prestigious Catholic school in the area. And it really mattered to him that he went there. He wanted so badly to go there. I, he called it in his memoir, his Oz. Mm. It loomed so large for him, like, you know, both in the literal sense, but, you know, all these things are tied up in that sort of chip on the shoulder thing that we're talking about, where it's like, it mattered that he moved when he was an adult to Greenville, Delaware, which is the area northwest of Wilmington where all the DuPont money is and it's a big mansions and he always obsessed over real estate and someone told me a story about how when he was a young senator he would get on planes and instead of like reading briefing materials or bringing a magazine um, you know Time or Newsweek he would pick up Architectural Digest or just take out his <laughs> legal pad and start sketching home designs like this is what he did like this is what was running through his mind yeah. In his downtime, you know, that was an affluent community. And it was an affluent Irish Catholic community. So all of this stuff is wrapped together, and it's like you could spend years untangling it. When we come back, Politico's Ruby Kramer and Ryan Lizza take a look at how President Biden's position on abortion has shifted over the years.
welcome back. We've turned over the podcast this week to Politico's podcast, Playbook Deep Dive, which back in September took a long look at how President Biden has navigated abortion as a Roman Catholic. All right, so let's switch a little bit to the politics of the issues you raised. So you point out that Biden is very private about his faith, but you also write about how his campaign built this enormous faith program in 2020, which helped him make small gains in important spots in swing states in the general election. Tell us about that effort. Yeah. What was interesting about writing about that was in my conversations with the people who built that faith, I think they call it faith engagement program. I would always ask them the same question, which was when you are going to work for Joe Biden, running a faith program for him, did you ever sit down and like talk to him? Like, Hey, hey, man, hey buddy, like, how do you want to do this faith thing? Cause it's religion and politics is pretty complicated. Last I checked. Yeah. So I always like wanted to know, like, did these people ever sit down with Joe Biden and like ask him what were the boundaries of what this should look like? And the impression that I got is no, like no one ever did that. And I think what happened instead was they all just kind of like took their cues from watching him understanding that he was going to sort of like set the tone for the way that they would make the case to people who were sort of quote unquote faith voters. Yeah. You know, I always thought that was a really complicated thing. And if you're going to work for Joe Biden, it, it looks different than it would for Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, certainly, you know, Donald Trump or another Republican where evangelical right is like a huge political force and you really do need to think about it in that way, but it's sort of more complicated and strange for a Democrat. Yeah. Tell us the sort of brief history of Biden's views on abortion. Obviously with the Supreme Court's decision last week to allow the highly restrictive Texas abortion law to take effect, that issue is now front and center in our politics again. You know, Biden grew up in a time in the Democratic Party where there were um, politicians who favored abortion rights and were against abortion rights. It wasn't, uh, you know, the, the party was ideologically mixed on that. And he had to make some changes in his views on abortion as recently as, as, as the last campaign. So can you give us a sort of brief history of his relationship with that issue? Yeah, it's a painful one, I think, for him, truly. I, I do not think that he has ever not dreaded a vote on abortion. Hmm. He was one of, you know, sort of a set of pro-life, quote-unquote pro-life Democrats mm -hmm. who really resisted in particular any public funding of abortion. Even outside of that issue, though, when, when Roe v. Wade was decided he was not entirely comfortable with it. He's quoted in a very famous Kitty Kelly profile saying that the law went too far. I think a quote he probably immediately regretted along with like the entire entirety of that particular piece. Incredible piece. Incredible piece if you ever want to go back and look. So there's a great example of the issue coming before the Senate in the beginning of the Reagan years. And it was a amendment that would have allowed states to overturn Roe v. Wade. And he voted along with Republicans to support the amendment. And I think he, at the time, he called the decision the toughest of his Senate career at the time he was in his second term. And a year later, the, the same amendment came back up and he voted against it. So he has a history of struggling with this in public and changing his mind. And in the last campaign, the issue on the table was the Hyde Amendment, which bans public funding for abortion in most cases. And, you know, in 2019, we're talking about a primary with more than a dozen candidates, a lot of pressure from progressive activists on sort of litmus tests on every issue. Abortion was one of them. The Hyde Amendment by that time had been a part of the Democratic Party platform, repealing it, I should say, a part of the Democratic platform since 2016. So by this time, the party has really passed him by and he was under immense pressure to change his position. And do you remember the, the three-day period leading up to his decision to 
to reverse himself on Hyde. Well, I was just going to say, take us to that moment of him having to make this decision. I mean, he's in his 70s at this point. Right. He's 70, and... 77. He's, fi- you know, fighting for his life in his in this primary. And at this time, it really does not look like he's in a strong position to do well in the first contest in Iowa. Like, he's not looking his best right now. Like, let's be, let's, yeah. let's cut to the chase. Like, it's not looking yeah. amazing. And the reproductive rights groups really putting the pressure on. There are people inside his own campaign. He was at an ACLU forum and a volunteer on a rope line while being recorded by someone else asked him very pointedly and clearly, it was actually a kind of elderly woman who kind of got in his face and was like, will you support, will you commit to repealing the Hyde Amendment? And he said yes. And like, it was kind of muffled and the video was like really grainy and weird. And like, this just sort of appeared and was like, oh, like Joe Biden, what? Okay. And then his campaign said he misspoke. And there was a period of like three days where it was like really not clear at all what his position was. And then, you know, he finally came out and I think he just, and he he said he, he would support repealing it. And he has followed through on that as president. You know, his first White House proposed budget did not include Hyde Amendment language. The Hyde Amendment is basically like always in these funding bills saying, you know, yep. these funds will, you know, like asterisk, like none of these funds will be used for abortion, basically. And his budget did not have that in it. And that was like seen as a huge victory. So he got there. And I think he, I'm not sure he could have come out of that primary without yeah, yeah, getting there. I think the interesting thing will be watching how he deals with this Texas bill and seeing how he follows through on what he's promised, which is a quote, all of government offense to combat it and yeah. to block it. And the idea that the nation's second Catholic president could oversee like the death of abortion access, <laughs> you know, the fall of Roe v. Wade. This is a remarkable moment. I mean, it's really a, an interesting, complex and difficult position for him to be in, I think. Given the fact that he's always struggled with this issue, with the issue of abortion and changed his mind over time, what do you think happens if this Texas law continues to be a major issue in the midterms and, you know, even thinking to the, to his potential reelection, if uh, abortion rights are, are genuinely threatened across the country, either by the Supreme Court overturning Roe or these states copying the, the, the Texas law. Right now, the politics of this seem to be Democrats, you know, believe this is a sort of you know, the dog has caught the car moment for, for, for Republicans that the Texas law and what it does is is not politically popular and that it's actually a good issue politically for, for, for Democrats. What do you if, if that continues, do you think it's a struggle at all for Joe Biden to to campaign on that? Or is he well past having misgivings uh, on, on this issue at this point in his life? I think it's both. I think he knows what his position is. And he's not going to back away from that. I think if there were any chance of that happening, we would have seen it already. And I, I frankly, I didn't expect that. I mean, um, yeah. it, to do so would be so out of step with the mainstream Democratic Party. It just, I think he knows that. And I don't think that he has misgivings about it on an actual policy level. I think he's spoken very forthrightly and, and forcefully about women's reproductive rights and the importance of protecting that, you know, he's vowed at every which way to fight for that. Um, yeah. I think if the midterms or the reelect starts to look like it's going to be a conversation about abortion, then I think there are a couple of questions. How does his comfort level with talking about that look? What does that look like? And how does that change over time? And also, does it push this fight within the Catholic Church among the hierarchy of bishops that run the, that basically represent the U.S. church hierarchy? Does it then put the onus back on them 
even more urgently to make a stand, to go to war with him, to target him further on trying to bar him from taking communion and participate in his own Catholic faith. That's sort of something to watch. And I think at that point, does it become sort of a political problem for him? Is it a is that a sort of a private sort of torment? Is it a bother? Is it a nuisance? Is it something in between? I, you know, I think it'll be really interesting to see what the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops does eventually say about this Texas law, because there are so many other issues with the law too, like the way it's structured and the sort of citizen element of it. Like that runs counter to some of the teachings of the Catholic Church too. So, you know, this will. I think we, we've got to see how, how they kind of react to this as well. Ruby, thank you very much for sharing your insights and reporting and for coming on Playbook Deep Dive. Thank you, Ryan. Special thanks to our friends at Politico for this week's episode, which was reported by Ruby Kramer and hosted by Ryan Lizza. If you want more stories like this, you can subscribe to Politico's Playbook Deep Dive in all of the typical places. They drop new episodes on Fridays. I'm Dan Gorenstein, and this is Tradeoffs. Twenty twenty one was a banner year for health reporting. There's a, there's a bunch of shows that are focused on health care, but one actually stood out for me, and it's and not- just like last year, we sift through some of the best of the bunch. I spent a good bit of time this year looking for podcasts that are produced and hosted by physicians. Thinking about that intersection of healthcare um, and technology is critically important. So our I- best of twenty twenty list next time on Trade Offs. If you enjoyed today's episode of Trade-Offs and all the other episodes you've heard from us this year, we ask that you support this podcast with a tax-deductible year-end gift now at our website, tradeoffs.org. Choose the amount that's right for you, five bucks a month or $500. The Trade-Offs team is producer Ryan Levy, Chief of Strategy and Operations Jessica Silverman, Communications Manager Nora Tahiri, Operations Assistant Jamie Song, Sound Designer Andrew Perella, and Senior Producer... Leslie Walker. Tradeoff's theme song was composed by Ty Sitterman. Special thanks to the team at Politico for this week's episode. Adrian Hurst, Annie Reese, Jenny Ament, Irene Noguchi, Mike Zappler, and Carlos Prieto. Original music composed by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Tradeoffs is supported in part by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Arnold Ventures, the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics at the University of Pennsylvania, West Health, the California Healthcare Foundation, and the National Institute for Healthcare Management. The views expressed in this episode are those of the individuals and not those of Tradeoffs staff, advisors, or funders.